Hello. Uh, okay. Now, I hope the UN will be kind enough to factor in the fact that we're starting late and we get 30 minutes. Um, today's press conference is sponsored by the United Planet Faith and Science Initiative, and we will focus mostly on the science part. If I had to pay a few words of respect to the faith part of our name, I'd say we all need to pray about this mark, uh, Arctic methane emergency because, uh, as I've said to many of you here, this is the smoking gun going off. If we don't deal with methane, the methane emergency, we have very slim prospects of survival in my personal estimate. Um, we are sponsored by the Abibiman Foundation from Africa and the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development in Jerusalem. My name is Stuart Scott. I'm the founder of the UPFSI. I'm a member of the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, which can be found online at ameg.me. I'm also the Deputy Director General of ESCO, the International Ecological Safety Collaborative Organization. Today, I will, before I introduce our guests, I will give some expert testimony, shall we say, from Dr. Peter Wadhams, a professor of ocean physics from Cambridge University. He's the head of their polar ocean physics group. He's been researching the Arctic ice cap since the 1970s. He has over 300 peer-reviewed papers published, and he is one of the world's foremost authorities on the conditions and physics of the Arctic sea ice. And here are a few remarks from Dr. Wadhams on what the Arctic sea ice portends and the loss of the Arctic sea ice portends for humanity. At the moment, we have to rely on Shakov and Semiletov, uh, who've been doing that work, uh, and they have then expert knowledge of the seabed conditions, and they're the ones who are estimating the 50 gigatons. Um, so that, that could be revised up or down uh, if further work is done in that area. And do you think civilization could survive a 50 gigaton release of methane? Um, no, I don't think it can. Um, I think that the, if you look at the, the, the existing predictions of, of global warming rates, um, what's, what's kind of eerie is the fact that uh, the business as usual projections, even even the cautious ones produced by IPCC, are still giving us about four degrees of warming by the end of the century, and uh, with two degrees has been taken arbitrarily as the level beyond which nasty things happen. I don't know why it's two degrees, but but that will be reached by the middle of the century, and four degrees by the end of the century. Now, four degrees, people who calculated what that would do to food production, uh, to uh, die off of forests, to acceleration of warming due to various extra feedbacks that kick in, that the general conclusion is pretty dire, that, that if, if, you, if you get to four degrees of warming, then collapse of civilization is, is what's going to happen because the world won't be able to sustain anywhere near its present population. So the result will be chaos and warfare. Um, so that's, that's just that the eerie thing is that that's predicted by the IPCC uh, report, but the, the projection of warming by the end of the century is four degrees. But nowhere do they state at all that four degrees is a catastrophe for uh, economically and socially for the, for the planet. Um, and now, with this Arctic methane, you're simply adding another, uh, another element to the warming, even if it's only an extra 0.6. That brings forward the date at which catastrophic warming is achieved by maybe another maybe 20 years. Very serious situation, in the words of a, the foremost expert on the Arctic sea ice. Now, Today we have some, some live guests with us also, whose uh, testimonies are also important. We'll get to them in one moment. But I wanted to call your attention to a piece from the New York Times that appeared on November 30th. In particular, in their estimate of the COP, even with a deal to stop the current rate 
of greenhouse gas emissions, scientists warn the world will become increasingly unpleasant. Without a deal, they say the world could eventually become uninhabitable. This is mainstream press. Now, with us today we have Paul Beckwith, who is a professor of geography at the University of Ottawa. He teaches climatology and meteorology and researches abrupt climate change, both past and present. Paul will say a few words, followed by John Nissen, who will take most of the rest of the time today. He is the chairperson of the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, again, available at ameg.me. Paul. Yes, hello and welcome today. Um, so AMEG is, stands for Arctic Methane Emergency Group, and it's a group of um, people of, uh, from a variety of backgrounds, including climate scientists, uh, Peter Wadhams, as, as Stuart mentioned, movie producers, engineers, physicists like myself, and many other people, technical and non-technical. Um, we feel in AMEG that we carry a burden um, of knowledge about that, that, that scares us regarding the, the, uh, how the climate change, how, how, cl how the climate system, how quickly it can respond, how quickly it can change, and we feel this two degree Celsius message that is, we hear all the time from the IPCC is not really the benchmark that is important. So I'd like to introduce uh, John Neeson, the chairman of AMEG, and he will go into the details of, of what, what, our, what we've just determined. Hello. Um, this is the most important day of my life. Uh, as chair of AMEG, I'm presenting new information, observation, and theory, too new to be in the IPCC reports. So this will be news to many of you, probably most of you, or all of you, because some of the important theories that I've developed with Peter Wadhams, who you saw uh, uh, in that film clip, um, so, uh, some of them are uh, very relevant to the situation. Um, climate change is happening now. It's the weird weather uh, that you've uh, uh, been exhibited all over the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and, and it's about to get far worse. The abrupt climate change the world has been observing recently is, is due to Arctic warming. The Arctic has been warming much faster than the rest of uh, the planet. If the Arctic continues to warm, things will get worse and worse, and we'll end up with that situation described in the New York Times here, when the planet will become uninhabitable, I'm afraid. So, that's, and that's happening now, and we've got to stop it. So, what's going on? Well, uh, the Arctic has started a vicious cycle of warming and melting. This is the start of a runaway meltdown of the, of, of the whole of the Arctic ice cap. It has to be stopped. AMEG believes that it can be stopped by cooling the Arctic quickly, and we have some top engineers advising us on how that can be done. The public is not being told the truth about Arctic meltdown. Governments are doing nothing to stop Arctic meltdown. This is why I'm giving this press conference. We need action. Um, okay. Um, I'm a scientist and an engineer. I, I've educated as a scientist and uh, did engineering and went into computer systems. And I look at the planet and I marvel at how the Earth system has kept the planet suitable for life for around two billion years, but with a few major extinction events to force evolution along. Then, for the past two and a half million years, the Earth has been caught, uh, the Earth system has caused temperature, climate, and sea levels to go up and down like a yo yo during the ice ages. And that's forced the rapid evolution of, uh, of uh, Homo sapiens. Then for the last 8,000 years, we've had amazing stability with constant temperature, sea level, weather, and apart from a few blips like the medieval cold period. So this stability has allowed the development of agriculture, civilization, industrialization, and a population of 7 billion and rising. This apparent stability is entirely a fluke. 
it is my, my amazing good luck that we are here to, today looking back on the past. So, what is happening? Oh, it's gone too. Oh, hold on. Can you go back? That's the one. Right, our, our, our luck is that the sea ice is disappearing in a vicious spiral of warming and melting, which the ex, a lot of experts will uh, are, are hesitant about admitting. Uh, but Peter Waddams and I are convinced about it. We've done the engineering uh, calculations to show that this is actually what's happening. As the sea ice retreats, open water is exposed. Sunshine penetrates through fresh water on the surface into the heavy saline water below. The heat is stored through the Arctic winter with the ice above like a night storage heater. Then the next year, this heat melts the ice a bit faster. And this explains why we have a vicious spiral of warming and melting. Now, uh, Wadhams, please. Uh, Peter Wadhams agrees. He's made careful measurements of sea ice thickness in a number of submarine journeys spanning several decades. He observed a remarkable decline in sea ice thickness, and it seemed to be an accelerating decline. At a, real, uh, at a recent Royal Society event, he presented an analysis of all the measurements showing an exponential decline. This is the reality. Don't believe the models. This is the reality. You can see this from the... Uh, you can see it from this graph. Uh, even the child can understand that that is plunging, that cur curve of the observations. And the, uh, this is not from this year, but it's, uh, it, it's showing that uh, next year might be September uh, when it gets to zero. And what does that mean when it gets to zero? It means there's no sea ice cover over the Arctic Ocean. And we call that a blue ocean event. That's quite a nice image, isn't it? You look out over the ocean and it's all open water. Uh, consequences. Yes, and now, uh, this blue event is coming fast. It could, be, you know, it could even be next year. Well, let's hope it isn't. There's already an escalation in lots of things as a result of the warming that's going on. And that's, that's an escalation, it's an acceleration, exponential effects. There's rapid emission of methane, that you, uh, which you can see on the right there. There's a the substantial uh, loss in Greenland with exponential rise in sea level, which you can see on the left. And there's a disruption of jet stream behavior with abrupt climate change. This is the weird weather, and it's leading to crop failures. It's leading to <coughs> rising food prices. And David's. Uh, that's a graph showing the rising food prices, uh, and, it's, and it's showing conflict. And the conflict are all those uh, um, unrest in uh, Egypt and Syria and Uganda and Mozambique. There's a whole list of them on there. And it's very significant. So Titanic. Next one. Right, nobody's promoting effective action to prevent the Arctic tipping into a new ice-free state. Nobody's slamming on the reverse gear or whatever to avoid disaster. We are busy arranging the chairs on the deck. So we dread this. We all, in our group, we all dread this blue ocean event. And it could be as early as September 2015. So Peter and I, Peter Waddams and I, believe that soon after this event, that there will be big changes in the atmospheric circulation and ocean currents, locking the Arctic into a sea ice free state. So it will be stay, it will say sea ice, free of sea ice. And then all hell will let loose. We're seeing the Earth system doing what it has done in the past when it produced great meltwater pulses. Rapid warming in the Arctic melted the ice sheets. The sea level rose at five centimeters per year. That is about one meter in 20 years. Can you imagine the effect for all those islands, low-lying countries, and conurbations by the sea? It is catastrophic. Then there is complete chaos in the weather, atmospheric circulation. 
Right. Um, now, this is the standard thing. With uh, You've got three bands of uh, weather systems in the northern hemisphere. You've got uh, the trade winds, which are easterlies, and then above that, you've got westerlies, and then uh, at the North Pole, you've got easterlies again. Now, if you get... To, uh, if you start warming the North Pole enough, you get rid of that whole circulation at the North Pole. And the westerlies stretch up right up to the North Pole. That's a complete change of climate. You know, much different, much more severe than anything we dreamt of happening. And it's time bomb. And uh, as you've already heard from Peter Wadhams, there is a time bomb sitting there and one of the only ways to kind of uh, reduce the chance of that going off is to cool the Arctic. So, next one. Uh, we can send men to the moon and we can put a lander on a comet uh, the other day. We can observe what's happening to our planet from space and we get a good perspective and think of it from outside. Now it is up to us humans to use our intelligence and technology to restore the old norm of constant climate and sea level to our planet. We can do it. Of course we can do it, but only if we act quickly and decisively. Uh, in, the, in the words of Winston Churchill, I'm sure you recognize him, owing to past neglect in the face of plain, plainest warnings, we have entered upon a period of danger. The area procrastination is coming to its close. In its place, we are entering a period of consequences. We cannot avoid this period. We are in it now, and we are in it now. Sultorship. Well, fortunately, AMEG has one of the most reassuring people I know. He's a brilliant, absolutely brilliant engineer called Stephen Salter, and he's invented the system uh, for spraying salt into the uh, into the atmosphere, and the droplets evaporate to produce microscopic salt crystals which are wafted into the sky through natural circulation of the air. These crystals then act to brighten the clouds, they are cloud condensation nuclei, uh, for those of you who are with the science. When you brighten the cloud, the surface underneath the cloud is darkened and cooled, so the uh, Atlantic Ocean, uh, where we would put these things, is cooled by having these clouds. And he reckons that with 200 ships, he could produce enough cooling power uh, to counter the uh, warming effect that's going on in the Arctic. And he is just brilliant, simply brilliant. Um, this, anyhow, uh, the idea is to, um, to put these ships in the Arctic because the Arctic was warmed originally from the Gulf Stream uh, warming and global warming warming the Gulf Stream even more. Uh, so if we can cool that, how long, how long have I got? Okay. We've done the engineering calculation. It can be done. Now, the fossil fuel co companies don't really want the Arctic cool. Uh, so they, they're very happy when people say, oh, geoengineering is dangerous. Actually, uh, there's uh, very little dangerous about this at all. It's very benign. It's like spray from the seashore. What we need is international leadership. Lead, um, uh, is leadership and, and the setting up of an international task force specifically mandated to ensure that the Arctic is cooled as quickly as safely as possible. The good, good news is that this cooling is quite feasible and it's surprisingly cheap, uh, less than a billion dollars a year, and it can be done using cloud cooling techniques. Uh, there are alternatives uh, to, to the uh, cloud cooling one. Uh, which are a little bit more expensive. Um, now, billions of dollars are being pledged to poorer countries to allow them to adapt to climate change. Uh, but wouldn't they prefer if, if the climate change didn't happen? Wouldn't they prefer it if the meters of sea level rise didn't happen? Wouldn't they prefer, prefer to see money spent on perversion, for, uh, prevention rather than adaptation, et cetera, et cetera? What, what is sensible use of our money? Yet, we are not being given a choice. We're not being told that this is the way to, to avoid growing misery uh, and bloodshed around the, the world by the simple expedient of cooling the Arctic. 
Why not? Is it because the climate experts are so focused on the emissions reductions that they're not seeing the bigger picture? I wonder. Anyhow, yesterday I went round asking all sorts of people what they thought about the Arctic situation as I described it. People were obviously shocked, deeply shocked. But one person was not shocked. He told me something that shocked me. I have to tell you because I came to Lima to tell the truth. They, and I, uh, this is what he said, they, and I don't know who they are, do know what's going on. They do know that the sea ice is disappearing very rapidly. They do not want geoengineering to cool the Arctic. They do know that geoengineering would work, but they are only too happy when people talk about geoengineering as being too dangerous. They don't care about what happens to the planet if the sea ice disappears. That is exactly what they want to happen. Do these people understand what's going on? By letting the sea ice disappear, they're creating misery for themselves, their children, their stakeholders, the whole world. It'll become a matter of life and death. They are being unbelievably stupid. But let us put this behind us. We don't want to make enemies. We need everybody behind this effort to cool the Arctic before it's too late. Uh, we want the, the fossil fuel industry behind us. It has skills for dealing with the Arctic. We want the modelers who can help to target the interventions and check the effects of, of the interventions. And we want the IPCC, who we people trust for dealing with the CO2 problems, uh, which incidentally uh, require quite different intervention from what we are proposing for the Arctic. Um, and uh, we might, uh, you might mention that tomorrow. But this is a call for collaboration from everybody who can help avert this catastrophe, to avoid us passing the point of no return, the blue ocean event that could be happening any year. So we've got to really get a move on. This could be the greatest collaborative venture of all time, where everybody in the world wants the same result. This can be a turning point in history. Let's make it happen. There is a way to avoid the growing misery, starvation, economic collapse and bloodshed around, that we're seeing already growing around the world by the simple expedient of cooling the Arctic. Let us be clear that the choice we make now, whether or not to act quickly, decisively and with determination to cool the Arctic, is a matter of life or death for our grandchildren. This is AMEC's message. This is why I've come to Lima to tell you, please make my trip to Lima worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Again, that was John Nithin, Nissen, the chairperson of the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. Can I get my slides back, please, for just one moment? Again, um, we are, I think, making up a little bit of time for the uh, uh, group that came before us that, that ran over. So we're, we're at the end. Um, again, my name is Stuart Scott, and I'll give you my email address. If you have any further questions, I can pass those questions on to our the two gentlemen with us. I also have access to Peter Wadhams, um, especially for the press. And uh, I encourage you to meet with us out in the hall if you have questions you'd like to ask now in the uh, hopes that we can make up a little bit of time for, uh, for the UN. I think we may have time for one question, if, if someone has. Yes, with your hand up. I like to ask which countries can play an important role to change things, and well, how NGOs can be involved for this campaign. Thank that, you. That's a, a, a simple question, difficult answer. Uh, the countries that are are the industrialized, wealthiest countries. I would, off the top, say if if China, and Russia, and the U.S. and the European Union banded together, and made a consortium to do some serious research and development and then implement on a wartime schedule, that is, we have to do this fast, we could probably bring the situation under control. Uh, in terms of what the NGOs can do to help is really get the word out about this methane emergency, which is underreported. It's completely underreported. We're not being told. It's not being factored into the equations by which the models that govern the IPCC report um, uh, determine our targets. And that's no one's fault particularly, but the IPCC models, well, the rules say that the science has to be out there 
in the public peer-reviewed paper for two years. If you add on to that the year it takes to do the research and, and uh, write the paper and the year it takes to get published, you have a four-year delay until this kind of information can make it into the IPCC report. So we need the NGOs to get this out there. Thank you. Well, can I just um, add, add to that? Because um, uh, cooling the Arctic is, is going to be quite simple if it's um, uh, just ships in the, but we might have to do other things as well because we've, we're running out of time. And we have to do things that a lot of you think are very unpleasant, like putting uh, uh, sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere. Now, I, uh, I know that's very unpleasant, but if, if your child is dying and the only way of treatment is to give some unpleasantly tasting medicine, you give the medicine, don't you? So we must all, we must all be behind that, this emotionally. We must encourage the people who are actually doing the work. I'm afraid uh, we, we must make it as simple as possible. Excuse me, John. I'm afraid, sir, we'll have to take your question in the hall, and we will make up the four minutes yes. that our uh, predecessors used for a very worthy message. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. We will have another press conference tomorrow, and it will dis further discuss the problem. So please come and bring more people. We really need the press to be here, the NGOs. We need to fill the room. Help us. Thank you. And that's uh, at 12 p.m. Uh, tomorrow with the same room. Uh, 12 o'clock noon tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah.